Uh, it's great to be bringing you God's a word from James chapter 4. Uh, we're in a series uh, in the book of James, which is all about real faith. It's, it's a real practical book. It's actually uh, showing us how we are to live, uh, how real faith changes the way that we live. It changes the way that we endure trials. Uh, we now do it with joy. Uh, it changes the way we approach God's word. We do what it says. Uh, it helps us to treat people impartially. Uh, real faith helps us to obey God even when it's difficult. Uh, and, we, and real faith shows us that we use our words to bless and not curse. And last week we saw how real faith enables us to receive a wisdom that's from above. And today we'll be seeing how uh, real faith uh, enables uh, us to have an attitude change. Uh, before we read James chapter 4, uh, let's ask God to help us understand his word. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you for who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. As we come now to your word, uh, would you please renew our minds? Uh, would you please speak to us through your word so that we may know how you want us to live? Uh, please bypass any initial resistance in us to obey your word. Uh, please keep us from justifying our sinful attitudes, allowing your word to teach, reprove, correct and train us in righteousness. Uh, may your Holy Spirit work powerfully in each of us, helping us to adore and appreciate Jesus Christ even more. For we ask it in his mighty name. Amen. Uh, let us now listen to God speak to us in James chapter 4, uh, verse 1 to 12. It says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Uh, you desire and do not have, so you murder. Uh, you covet and cannot obtain, uh, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Uh, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? Uh, this is the word of the Lord. How do you handle conflict? Uh, how do you handle conflict? Uh, do you tackle it head on? Or do you try and avoid conflict at all costs? Or are you a bit passive aggressive in your approach? So how do you handle conflict? You see, conflict is everywhere. Uh, you just have to turn on uh, the television or look at your screen to see that there are wars going on between Israel and and Hamas, and Russia, and Ukraine. Those are massive, large-scale conflicts. Uh, conflict also happens on a smaller scale too, uh, in our homes, at workplaces, at school. And we even see conflict here in church. You see, that's why James is writing uh, this section of his letter. He's writing to Christians who are fighting and who are quarrelling. James is tackling one of the biggest questions that has plagued humanity since the beginning. What's with all the fighting? And the short answer is sin. Uh, but what type of sin? Well, James shows us that it's sin. It's the sin of pride. It's the sin of self-centeredness. It's the attitude of me before you. 
And this is leading to fighting and quarrelling. And so if you want to uh, live peacefully at work, at home, at school, or even here in church, uh, we need an attitude change. We need a heart change. And James uh, shows us in this passage what that looks like. He gives us real practical uh, steps. So let's see. The big question today is, is on your outlines if you have them. Uh, how can real faith change our attitude? And so firstly, real faith enables us to approach people in humility. You see, real faith helps us to put others before ourselves. It helps us to consider them more significant than us. You see, in the passage just before, in chapter 3, James has just told uh, his readers, his listeners, that they are to be peacemakers. If you have real faith, you will be making peace. And now he just shows that they're not doing that. They're actually fighting and quarrelling. Why? Uh, Because of their selfish desires. Uh, We see that there in verse 1. Look there with me. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Uh, That's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. Our passions, our self-centered hearts are creating a conflict. It's causing us to fight and quarrel. We're insisting upon our passions. Uh, We know it's self-centred passions uh, because the word used for passion in verses 1 and in verse 3 uh, actually comes from the word for hedonism. So it's the love of self, the love of pleasure. Uh, That's what they're doing. And so rather than making peace, these guys are fighting and quarrelling because they're not getting what they want, what they crave, what they must have. You see, we can do this too, can't we? I don't think that just because you're here in church that you're exempt from the love of self, seeking pleasure and comfort. Uh, Just think for a moment, uh, what do you do when someone or something gets in the way of your comfort, gets in the way of your fun and enjoyment? Uh, What do you do? Do you you throw a tantrum, you know, kick and scream? That's my attitude. Uh, Do you you sulk and pout and drag your feet? Uh, Do you... Do you go and fight people and argue and quarrel like these uh, people that James is is referring to? You see, what do you do? What does your heart long for? You see, I do this sort of thing all the time. I've done this many times. When I don't get what I want, when something gets in the way of my pleasure, I get upset. I get angry. I I plead my case. You see, what's going on in my heart in those moments? I'm being self-centred. I'm being selfish. I'm caring about me and not about anyone else. And so when we behave like this, you know, alarm bells should be going off in our brain saying, actually, we're fighting and quarrelling. We're not making peace. Something is wrong. There is sin here. There is sin here. We're not making peace. We're creating disorder. We're hurting others because we're not getting what we want. Uh, James says this in verse 2. I wonder if you caught it there. It says... You desire and you do not have, uh, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, uh, so you fight and quarrel. You see, this is the ugly side of self-love, of self-centeredness. It leads us to harm others to, who might be stopping us from getting what we desire. It might not literally be, be murder, I, I hope it isn't. Uh, but what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, if you hate in your heart you're actually guilty of murder. Uh, Do you hate people who get in the way of your pleasure? You see, James is tapping into his older brother's teaching, uh, Jesus, that what we desire uh, is actually causing us to sin when it comes out in hatred, when it comes out in fighting, when we react negatively. Uh, Do you see how the self-centred attitude of me before you creates fights? Whereas the humble attitude towards others, by putting them first, actually leads us to peace. And so, uh, what should we be doing if we have real faith? Uh, We should be willing to go without our pleasures and our passions and desires from being met by people around us. Uh, We should stop elevating our desires to an ungodly height, uh, insisting upon them being met, which is causing fights and quarrels. 
uh, we should humble ourselves and consider others more significant than ourselves. But you know, James doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He gives us another indicator of our self-centered hearts. Uh, and it comes out in how we ask God for things. Uh, look with me at verses 2 and 3. It says, You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You see, once again, our self-centeredness is the problem. Our lack of humility is the problem. We just expect things to go our way. That's one of the big problems uh, with living in a country like this that is so wealthy. We don't bother asking for things that we need because we think we can do it ourselves. We don't need help until we do. And then, what do we do according to James? Uh, we ask God to give us what we selfishly desire. Not to bless others, not to glorify God, uh, but to satisfy, uh, our, and satisfy ourselves, to make ourselves feel good. Probably at someone else's expense. Uh, just look at how many people are addicted to things in our world. You know, be it drugs, be it games, be it sex or porn. What happens when something gets in the way of what they want? What happens when what they want is threatened? Well, they get the shakes. They get angry. They're ready for a fight. And so if you're in the habit of only coming to God are for things that satisfy your desires, you really shouldn't expect God to give you what you want. You know, he's not your own personal uh, wish maker. He's not a genie or Santa or a vending machine. It's not his job to give you everything your heart desires. See, parents don't give their kids everything that their heart desires, do they? And for good reason. And so God doesn't give us everything that we desire for good reason as well. Because if he did... Uh, we will continue to spiral downward in this self-love, this hedonistic desire until we eventually fight everyone and destroy ourselves. And so if you have real faith, uh, you'll want to be asking God for the things that he is passionate about rather than your own passions. Uh, you'll be praying that your desires and your passions align with his will, seeking to bless others uh, rather than fight with them. And just a small example of what this type of prayer looks like, uh, we see it in Jesus' prayer in John 17. Now, what did he pray for? He, play, he prayed for God to be glorified. He prayed for us to be in the world and not of the world. He prayed for us to grow in our knowledge of God and to be united in him. That was Jesus' prayer. Now, do you see how real faith actually changes our attitude towards people? how we can now put them first in humility, how we can ask God for the things he's passionate about rather than having our self-centered desires met. Uh, perhaps you're sitting there, you're thinking, you're already trying to do this. You're already trying to put others first, even in conflict. And if that's you, praise God for his work in your heart. Uh, but if it's not your habit to put others before you, asking God to satisfy every desire that comes into your mind, you need to be asking yourself why that might be the case. You see, another way our real faith can change our attitude is in the way that we approach God. Uh, this is our second point there. A real faith enables us to approach God in humility. Our relationship with God should motivate us to humbly approach him. You see, James now highlights that those with real faith in Jesus are actually in an exclusive relationship with God. It's like we're married, uh, which is why he then calls these people adulterers. Did you see it there in verse 4? He says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, what's this saying? It's saying a few things. It's saying that if we're chumming up to the world, if we're being a friend, a companion to the world, oh, that's actually inappropriate. It's like for those of us who are married and our spouse having a better friend uh, than we are to our spouse. You know, that's, that's inappropriate. Uh, this also shows us that chasing after the world and the things that the world offers 
is spiritual adultery. You know, for the sake of the kids here, I, I won't linger on the ins and outs of what adultery looks like, but it's not a pretty picture. You get the idea, don't you? It's like bringing an idol into the temple. It's disgusting, it shouldn't happen, and that's what we're doing when we are chasing after the world. And also, this, this verse, verse 4, also shows us that behaving like this is, like, is acting like an enemy of God. You know, because, you know, those who have been cheated upon, it hurts, it wounds, it's excruciatingly painful. It hurts you, your family, your assets, your community, your work, everything. It inflicts so much damage that you're like, wow, this is just like what an enemy would want me to suffer. And that's what we're doing here. We're like a spouse that's sleeping around, not caring how it affects the other. That's what they're doing, James says. It's pretty clear, isn't it? If you want to be God's enemy, it's very easy. Just chase after the world. But if you have real faith, you'll want to humbly pursue God instead of the world. You'll, you'll wish to be like God rather than being like the world. Instead of giving your time, energy and effort to things of the world, you'll want to devote yourself to God. And instead of hoping for the world to embrace you, uh, you'll want God's embrace. Now, do you see how real faith actually changes how we approach God, how we do that humbly? Uh, we, we remember that the world belongs to God. It's His. It's not here for us or our pleasures. And we remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross, enabling us to have this very personal relationship with God, this covenant relationship. We remember that Jesus enables us to not be enemies of God, but His friends, His covenant people who He's jealous for. We see, that, we see that there in verse 5. And friends, this reality, this, this reality should humble us as we come to God. Uh, that is, that those who have real faith will have an attitude change. They will want to humbly uh, go near to God and turn away from the world. And James, James goes on, he actually shows us how, what this looks like, the practical steps of what it means to draw near to God, to come near to him. And we see that there in verses 6 to 10. Yeah. In a word, it's to repent. Repent of living your own way for your own pleasures. Repent of pursuing the world. We need to repent of being proud, thinking that we don't need God. And we see that there in verse 6. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, God opposes the proud. He opposes those who think they don't need him, who think that they're right all the time, who fight and quarrel to get their way. God opposes them. Now let that sink in for a moment. Don't just breeze over it. The all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, almighty God opposes those who are proud. I hope that's not you this morning. We saw that in Psalm 8, that God opposes those who have haughty eyes, those who are proud. But I wonder if you caught the sweet promise as well in verse 6, that he gives grace to the humble. Yes, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, this is the gospel according to James. Uh, this is what the book of James is really about. This is the pivotal verse. If you underline anything today, if you hear anything this morning, let it be verse 6. God gives grace to those who deserve nothing but judgment. Those who humble, humbly approach him, who come before him. And this shouldn't surprise us because this has always been the case. We saw it in Psalm 18, uh, that God has always been gracious to the humble. And James, he unpacks what this looks like. You know, what does it mean to approach God in humility? Uh, we see it there in verses 7 to 10. Uh, just scan your eyes there with me for a moment. You see, it's God's grace that enables us to submit to him in verse 7, arranging our lives in his direction. It's God's grace that empowers us to resist the devil, opposing him with scripture like Jesus did. It's God's grace that allows us to draw near to him in verse 8, as we walk away from worldly pleasures. It's God's grace that permits us to clean our hands, to put away ungodly and sinful acts. It's God's grace that enables us to purify our hearts 
so that our hearts are devoted to him and him alone. And it's also God's grace that convicts us of our sin, verse 9, so that we grieve with a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. That's what humbling ourselves before God looks like, which James states in verse 10 there. And what's the promise? What's the promise for those who humbly approach God in this way? That he will lift us up. Or as James puts it, he will exalt us. That is, when we humble ourselves before God, he will give us grace so that we uh, can humbly walk before him all our days until we meet him in glory. Now, do you see how real faith actually changes the way that we approach God? That we do it now in humility, seeing ourselves as sinners in desperate need of his grace and forgiveness. Is that you today? Is that true of you? Do you know anything of God's grace in your own life? Do you want to turn away from pursuing worldly pleasures to draw near to God? Or do you grieve your sin, wanting to be made clean and pure in God's sight? I hope it is you. If it isn't you, then you need to be asking yourself if you actually have real saving faith. Uh, You need to look again at verse 4 and ask, does God see me as a friend of the world? You need to look again at verse 8 and ask, does God see me as a double-minded sinner? Literally a person with two masters or allegiances. Or does God see me as his child, trusting solely in the work of Christ on the cross? You know, are you relying on Jesus today, who who faultlessly uh, submitted to God, who perfectly resisted the devil, who always drew near to God, who was made sin for us so that we could be clean. In short, do you have real faith? The final way uh, real faith changes our attitude is in the way that we approach the law. We now do so in humility. Uh, That's uh, point three there. Real faith enables us to approach God's law in humility. And because we've been saved from having to fulfill the law, we can approach the law humbly. Uh, Therefore, those uh, who have real faith will be people of grace, not judgmental people, not legalistic people. You see, James now turns his attention of how real faith changes the way that we approach the law. It changes the way that we um, submit to God, who is the real lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy. Uh, We see it there in verse 12. Would you look at it with me? It says, There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. You see, we're all under God, the real lawmaker. And so James rebukes those who speak evil of other people, who break the law. We see it there in verse 11. It says... Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the law, uh, sorry, against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Do you see what the problem is? Uh, They're speaking evil of people, even believers. Literally, they're slandering Christians who have been saved by grace, not by obeying the law. And the fact that they're doing this, James says, uh, reveals something of their heart, that they're actually considering themselves above the law as self-appointed judges and lawmakers. Uh, We've seen this before, haven't we? We we remember the Gospels. We see the Pharisees and the way that they were trying to make laws for people to submit to, putting themselves in a higher place over their fellow men and women. You see, it's not our job to make laws for God and then enforce them. You know, I've always struggled with this. I don't know about you, but as, an, as the eldest child, I always struggled with this one. I would be constantly on my sister's case, pulling her up on things, telling her what to do, getting her into trouble and so on. I was that guy. It was awful. And do you know how I felt when she got in trouble? Yeah, I felt proud. I felt smug. I felt like good about myself because... I wasn't silly enough to break those rules. But you see what's happening there in my heart? Am I being humble or am I being proud? 
I'm obviously being proud. You see, what I was doing, what I was saying, gives me away. You see, our attitude towards the law should be one of humble submission. We should be seeking to be doers of the law rather than judging others or speaking poorly of other people. And so what should we do if we catch ourselves doing this type of thing or thinking and saying things that are unhelpful? Now we need to ask ourselves the question there at the end of verse 12. Did you see it? It says, but who are you to judge your neighbour? That's not a rhetorical. There is an answer there. And what's the answer? We're sinners saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. We're not lawmakers or the judge of everyone. No, we need to remember the gospel of grace here. How we fail to live up to God's law perfectly. We all deserve to be destroyed, like it says in verse 12. But by trusting in what Jesus has done in our place, who never broke the law, who was punished for every broken law that we do, and who rose from the dead so we can live a new law, the royal law of love, by trusting in him, we can actually approach the law in humility. We no longer need to be legalistic and judgmental of everyone because we're not saved by what we do, right? We're not saved by our obedience to the law. We're saved by Christ's obedience to the law. And that should humble us. You know, whose job is it? It's God's job to judge people based on the law. He's the boss. He's in charge. Now, do you see how our real faith changes the way that we approach the law? And maybe you're already doing this. Maybe you're quick and you're trying not to uh, pull people up all the time and speak evil of others. Well, if that's you, praise God for his work in your heart. Or perhaps you're not too careful about what you say and think about others when they stuff up, when they make mistakes, when they, break, uh, when they disobey and break, thing, break God's law. Well, if that's you, you need to remember the real lawgiver. And newsflash, it's not you. Uh, you need to remember that God doesn't treat you based on your ability to obey the law, does he? He treats you based on his grace. You need to, you need to remember that you've been saved from destruction uh, because of his grace. So now you can humbly approach the law uh, in humility, relying on God's grace to, to empower you to live like that. You see, we should all be in the habit of pointing each other to the real lawgiver who actually can save. You see, we need to point to our good and gracious God. And so we've seen today uh, that one of the marks of real faith is our attitude, our attitude of humility towards people, towards God and towards his law. Uh, can you imagine what our uh, communities would be like if everyone humbly approached people, God, and his law? Imagine all the fights you're in or have been in in the past. What would happen if everyone in that fight put others before themselves? Imagine what would happen if everyone submitted to God humbly and repented when they go astray, when they love the world or love themselves. Imagine what would happen if we all uh, acted humbly towards the law, if we all approached the law with, in humility rather than being judgmental or legalistic about it. Well, how wonderful would it be in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools and community? How wonderful would it be here if we all tried to be humble in our approach to people, God and his law? Surely this place would be full of grace. And you know, that's exactly what heaven will be like, full of grace and peace. We'll be with God. There'll be no more fighting, no more quarrelling. We'll be full of joy and peace as we enjoy him and closeness with him forever. What a beautiful uh, time that will be. Now let's, let's ask God to give us the grace we need uh, to walk humbly before him until Jesus returns or he calls us home. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you for your amazing grace towards us in Christ. How you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but that you fully and freely forgive us as we humbly approach you in repentance. Uh, please help us to uh, put others before ourselves, particularly when we're fighting and quarrelling with them. Please help us to ask you for things that align with your word and your will, rather than seeking to have our own selfish desires met. Uh, please 
help us grieve uh, the sin in our life that caused Jesus to go to the cross, uh, to take the punishment for it. Help us grieve our sins that hurt others and hurt you. And please help us to not speak poorly of each other, of our brothers and sisters, but to humbly approach the law, realising that we've been saved by grace and we can live out this new, amazing, royal law of love. Help us to love you and love others well. We ask all these things so that uh, your name would be made great and that your people would enjoy the blessing of people who approach you in humility. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.